immediately in the aftermath of the verdict, we um, had received information that that we needed to look into what happened in the jury room. I did not have a conversation with any juror about anything related to this case. I find that the clerk of court is not completely credible as a witness. And so after much reflection, I have decided that it is best not to run again for re-election. Clerk of Court Becky Hill resigning, but she's still in hot water as the investigations into her conduct during Alec Murdoch's murder trial continue. And Diddy's homes have been raided. This is in connection with a sex trafficking investigation. So will this bad boy end up behind bars? Plus, we're breaking down momfluencer Ruby Frankie's own words relating to the abuse of her young children. It's all coming up next for you, plus much more right here on opening statements. Good Tuesday morning to you and welcome to opening statements. I'm your host, Julie Grant. If you're new to the show, welcome. This is just like the opening statements in a trial where we get you all primed and ready to go to hear the case evidence, except it's morning time. I say the show's kind of like coffee in court. We're relaxed here. We get all warmed up together. So right now, why don't you go ahead and grab that cup of coffee because it's time for my opening statement. Really? Really? A resignation press conference outside of the courthouse in Culleton County, South Carolina for clerk of court Becky Hill? She wanted the world to know that she loved her job and she's proud of the work that she's done and she's now resigning her position. Gotta tell you, my friends, it was the weirdest press conference I've ever seen. She said she wanted to address her constituents her constituents. She's acting like she's the mayor of New York City. Sure, clerk of court is an important position in every county. I am not trying to take anything away from the wonderful men and women who serve in those positions. I am just talking about the way this particular clerk of court has been behaving. Because she's not acting like a clerk of court, she's acting more like a clerk of controversy. Becky Hill is the subject of two, two, pending criminal investigations right now with SLED. She's admitted to plagiarizing the book that she wrote about the Murdoch trial. And her alleged comments to the jury almost caused the whole case to be overturned. And it still might. Remember, Murdoch is still going to be taking an appeal. He lost the motion for a new trial at the trial court level. That's what we watched recently. But Perhaps his team will be resurrecting those same issues to an appellate court who might feel differently than the trial judge. What a mess. Becky Hill should be quiet. If she would have been a little more quiet in the first place, maybe she wouldn't be in this position, huh? And why resign now? I'm sure you were thinking too, why now? What does she know that we don't know? And lastly, the former constituent, who is no doubt the happiest about her resignation, has got to be good old Alec Murdoch. I wonder if he feels a sense of hope with this news. He might. He may think that he won't be the only prominent person in Colleton County to stand trial. That's my opening statement on this Tuesday morning. Let me know if you like it right now. I want to give you what's on your daily docket. Deneen and Beverly wanted to get rid of him because he was abusing the kids and Beverly phys physically, mentally, sexually. Deneen told me that Beverly wanted to knock him unconscious and suffocate him. All right, my friends, here's a look at a few of the cases we're following for you today on Court TV in Michigan. Testimony resumes at 8.30 a.m. in the fugitive wife murder trial. In New Hampshire, the small town secrets murder case starts back up at 10 a.m. And in Massachusetts, defendant Karen Reed is due in court at 9 a.m. for a motions hearing ahead of her upcoming murder trial. Right now, let's get you more about the fugitive wife murder trial. Did you see what happened yesterday? Ooh, let's go live this morning now to Charlotte, Michigan, where this case is happening. That's where we find Court TV legal correspondent Kelly Kraft with the very latest for us. Kelly, good morning. <laughs> 
Good morning to you, Julie. Court is going to be getting underway really soon here in Charlotte, Michigan. The judge told the council, make sure you're on time because I want to be ready to go at 830. So that's going to be getting underway very shortly. We're expecting to hear from a blueberry farmer who found the victim's burned body. But yesterday, Julie, what a day. The state kicked it off with two really big witnesses. We heard us first heard from Chris McMillan. Now he admitted that he had a role in the killing of the victim in this case on the stand. He wore sunglasses on the stand talking about how he has trouble with his eyes and this has been something that's been ongoing for a number of years and he described the gruesome murder saying that they used a baseball bat, a hammer, they suffocated Robert Carabella, then they put him in a trunk burned his body and left his remains. We also heard from the defendant and the victim's daughter, Cicely. Let's listen to her testimony. I remember falling asleep and being woken up by an explosion in the woods was the next I recall from that night. I sat up and looked out the back of the window where the explosion was coming from. I noticed my half-sister running from the woody area away from the fire. Our van was already pretty much moving. The door was open and she was trying to catch up to the vehicle as, as if it was a getaway van. And Julie Sicily on the stand said that she eventually confronted her mother about this situation and her mother blamed the death of her father on Deneen, her half-sister that you just heard Cicely mention, as well as Christopher McMillan. So we'll have to see what happens later on today, but exciting testimony here in Charlotte, Michigan. It sure was. Uh, Kelly, I can't wait to see what happens today in just a short time. I know that jury's due back early. We'll let you go back in the courtroom. Kelly Kraft, thank you kindly for that early update. We'll see you later. Right now, let's turn back to embattled clerk of court, Becky Hill. Another significant impact in our clerk's office was in 2023 when we had to manage one of the biggest trials in South Carolina history. Our small town came together and made everyone proud. Managing a trial was such importance to the people of South Carolina as well as of the national and international media, interest and public scrutiny, and has caused me to reflect upon decisions involving my stay in the office of the clerk of court. And so after much reflection, I have decided that it is best not to run again for reelection. I will now be able to focus on being a wife, a mother and grandmother to my two grand boys, and will be spending time with the people who mean the most to me. So as you saw there, Becky Hill is claiming she's not seeking re-election because she wants to spend more time with her family, not because of the investigations going on with SLED right now into her conduct. So we're wondering, could those investigations be playing a larger role than Becky Hill is letting on? Here to talk about it, I have a great guest joining us this morning. He represents the families of both Stephen Smith and Gloria Satterfield. Attorney Eric Bland is with us. Eric, good morning. Nice to have you today. Would you good morning. share with us, please, morning, your reaction Julie. to how Becky Hill was appearing during that press conference? She seemed pretty upbeat. She was smiling at times. I'm curious your impressions of just watching her and how she behaved. Well, obviously, this was a long time coming. She was a little bit tone deaf, uh, even before Justice Toll said that she had lost credibility. Becky had lost the trust and confidence of her own office of her subordinates because some of her subordinates have reported her to the ethics committee. She lost the confidence of the court administration and I'm sure our chief justice, Don Beatty, uh, at the time. So this was not surprising. Uh, the timing of it is surprising because it's right before she was supposed to register to seek reelection. I suspect that there's uh, something coming down the road regarding charges or just maybe damning conclusions from the investigation, but she could not run for clerk of court. And I think that um, our governor was probably going to remove her from office. And maybe this goes a long way towards SLED and the AG in how they're viewing her investigation. But she 
she she could not stay in office, Julie, not with uh, some of the admissions she made and certainly not with the conclusion reached by Justice Toll. Right, right, Eric. Thank you for pointing that out. Justice Toll found Becky Hill not to be credible. You know, even though she did not, as we know, grant Alec Murdoch a new trial at the trial court level, as you know, Eric, he can still appeal. I wanted to make that clear to our viewers this morning in opening statements. And so he, he may be um, able to resurrect this issue on appeal. Uh, Eric, do you think that could be grounds for the overturning of this whole trial? Well, I'm not so sure about you know, her resignation. I'm not even so sure about uh, what may happen with these investigations. Um, it just depends if our Supreme Court adheres to the current case law and said that they had to, the defense had the burden of showing that whatever Becky said or did influenced the verdicts. And you remember uh, 11 of the 12 jurors said that nothing that Miss Becky said some didn't even hear it, uh, influenced their verdicts. It was their own free will. But there is a federal case law uh, based on a Supreme Court decision that if you could just show that the clerk of court exceeded her uh, duties and did make statements to the jury that were not ministerial but were material, that there would be an automatic new trial. And I think that's what the defense is counting on. I'm not sure they're going to get it at our Supreme Court level, but according to Harpootlian, obviously they'll move on to the federal level. Um, that's years down the road, but it could come. Boy, Eric, appreciate that. Uh, let's take a look at the two investigations ongoing right now with SLED pertaining to Becky Hill. So the first of which is regarding her alleged interactions with the jurors in the Murdoch case, and the second one is regarding allegations she used her elected position for financial gain. Eric, your opinion, please, as to whether you think there's any merit to either of these and if we will see her criminally charged in the near future. I'm not sure whether we'll see her criminally charged, uh, but it appears that there were tours that were put on, and I don't know if she charged for those tours. Um, certainly, uh, the fact that she was writing a book during the time the trial was going on, or at least had that intention, and you heard some witnesses say that she, you know, made statements uh that really were going to be part of her book, that she wanted Alex to be guilty as opposed to not guilty. Um, don't forget, there may be a third investigation that's going on, Julie, which involves her son. Her son was um, is being investigated and was charged for wiretapping some of the people who work for the county and not sure whether Becky had knowledge of that. They confiscated her phone and whether the son was doing those wiretaps to benefit his mother or for some other purpose, but she's also ground up in that. There, there's so much going on with Becky. Um, you know, she admitted to plagiarizing a lot of her book, but I think the most damning statement was when she said the justice told that she made some things up because she had poetic license and justice toll said well isn't that just lying and she didn't really understand that as an author you have to be truthful you just can't make things up about people so it was time for becky uh to leave remember this is a position that goes with the preface honorable the honorable becky hill and i don't think she can no longer uh, say that she is in a position of being called honorable. So well said, Eric, you're right. Yeah, she took an oath to serve the people of the county, and we'll see if she was serving herself. Eric, before we let you go, please, wanted to ask you about one of your clients that people around the world care a lot about, Sandy Smith. We saw her in the courtroom watching that hearing play out where the Murdoch defense team was arguing for a new trial for him. And she was there. She was seated in the gallery watching it all. Uh, curious how she's doing today, if there was any reaction from her that she might have shared with you yesterday to the news of Becky Hill's resignation. It really, um, I did speak with her, but it really didn't have any effect on her regarding her case. Um, she remains opt cautiously optimistic that the investigation is ongoing. Um, but admittedly, we are starting to feel a little bit like, are we ever going to get answers? We are being told that SLED is investigating, that there's six people that possibly have information regarding what happened to Stephen. 
but it, the more time that goes on, the less uh, optimistic we are. Um, one thing that happened last week, Julie, there was a victim's rally at the State House, and our Attorney General Alan Wilson spoke, and he told us that he would meet privately with Sandy Smith. So now we'll be able to at least have an ear with the Attorney General in addition to SLED, and hopefully we, we find some answers for this woman. Oh, isn't that the truth? Uh, Alan Wilson's a great advocate. We all got to see him in action during the Murdoch yes, trial. He did that gun demonstration with Dr. Kenny Kinsey that, for me, just really tipped the scales of justice for the prosecution. Eric Bland, we've got to leave it there for today, but thank you so much for coming on opening statements this morning. We'll see you soon. And here's what we have coming up next. God told me when I was driving before I called you. I didn't have any information. I didn't know anything. And the Spirit said, your children are going to be removed. And I just, I cried out loud. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not done. I'm not ready. And God told me I'm done. We're breaking down Ruby Frankie's own words in both jail calls and journal entries. She's talking about the abuse of her children. And when we come back after this break, the latest on the sex trafficking allegations and the raid of the homes of music mogul Sean Diddy Combs. This is what's trending in true crime. Monday, Department of Homeland Security agents raided Diddy's Los Angeles and Miami homes. We're told this is a sex trafficking investigation that has commenced, and it's unclear if Combs is the specific target of the investigation. That has not yet been confirmed, and Diddy has not yet commented on the raids. We know recently he's been hit with multiple sexual assaults lawsuits, including a lawsuit from singer Cassie that was settled last year. Our question this morning, could the raids put this bad boy behind bars? We have an excellent power panel standing by. Let's bring them all in. The director of prosecution projects at Florida International University and former homicide prosecutor Melba Pearson, professor and retired NYPD detective Mike Alcazar, and entertainment commentator Holland Reed. Wonderful to have you all this morning. Detective Mike, I'd like to begin with you, please. I understand that this investigation is a federal one that is based in New York. Uh, talk to me, please, about the seriousness of this, the severity, and how far along you think these agents may be. I think they've moved fairly quickly. Uh, they've executed the search warrant, so they have established probable cause enough to uh, execute the warrants yesterday in, in two locations. So I think they're moving pretty fast. They want to get as much evidence as they can any kind of personal devices, computers, surveillance, personal recordings. So I, I think it's uh, time is of the essence in this case, and they're trying to get as much evidence as possible. Mm -hmm. Mike, thank you. Melba Pearson, to you next, please, really drawing on your experience as a prosecutor. Uh, do you think there could be some federal prosecutors who are working in conjunction with those DHS agents uh, as they are working this sex trafficking investigation? Yes, good morning, Julie. And I believe that the U.S. Attorney's Office would be working with the detectives from the standpoint of helping them direct where they should be looking for, the types of evidence that's going to be helpful in building the sex trafficking case against uh, Sean Diddy Combs, as well as to review what's been found, just to get an, a universe and an idea of what evidence has been collected and what charges can be substantiated based on the evidence that's been recovered. So it, I, I do believe that this is a partnership in some ways. It's not abnormal. Uh, oftentimes, the prosecutor's office will direct or advise law enforcement as to where to look, what they're looking for specifically, because they have an end goal in mind. So, you know, it is possible that the the uh, agents are doing this search on their own based on a tip, but in all likelihood, they are in communication with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Melba, thank you for that. Could the bad boy wind up behind bars? Holland Reed, tell us about the public sentiment, if you would, please. Wow, um, Julie, there 
I think it's a little bit all over the place and it's one of those things where everything in the dark is coming to light and it's coming fast, um, as the other guests have said. This has been down the rumor mill for a very long time, um, for decades even, that Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, whatever he calls himself these days, um, is known for these antics. He's known for um, these wild parties. He's known for a, a, a myriad of, of fetishes, so to speak. And I think that part of that with the raid being that he liked to keep videos, um, hidden videos, which was part of one of the lawsuits, as the young lady said that she was being filmed um, without her consent and she was underage. So I believe this is just the beginning. I believe the raid, as big as it was and as extravagant as it was, is going to absolutely um, just bring everything else to the surface, uh, kind of like an Epstein situation. Maybe even worse is what the rumor mill is saying. Right, Holland. Excellent points. This could be what leads to Diddy's downfall. We have a statement from Cassie Ventura's attorney. Obviously, she was Diddy's former girlfriend, an artist on his label, and uh, settled that big suit last year, uh, saying, quote, we will always support law enforcement when it seeks to prosecute those that have violated the law. Hopefully, this is the beginning of a process that will hold Mr. Combs responsible for his depraved conduct. Mike Alcazar, back to you. Do you think we're going to see the bad boy locked up? Yeah, it depends on what information they retrieve, what kind of evidence, what kind of witnesses they have testifying against Combs. Um, yeah, I think he's going to be arrested. Mm -hmm. And Melba Pearson, do you agree? Sad but true. As someone who was a Diddy fan, um, after reading the uh, testimony and the, and the uh, lawsuit that was filed by Cassie Ventura, some of the things he was alleged to have done was beyond depraved. And so I think we may have a situation a la R. Kelly, um, where basically many more folks will come forward, male and female, uh, to discuss the abuse that they suffered. So I think that his ship is sunk. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Uh, we'll leave it there for now. But of course, we're watching this story very closely. Any more details about it, you'll see them here on Court TV. Turning to another big trending story right now, defendant Brian Koberger's lawyers are running out of time to deliver the specifics on his alibi defense. We know he's accused of murdering four University of Idaho students in their off-campus home back in November of 2022. And next month, his attorneys must inform the judge where Koberger was during the murders and the witnesses he intends to call as part of the alibi defense. His team says they're going to be presenting. This is a look at the judge's order, and these could be the biggest revelations we see in this case because we know the trial's been kicked to next year. And so this could be bombshell evidence that comes out. So we're wondering this morning, are we going to see witnesses come forward for Koberger? Is anybody going to say they were with him at the time of these homicides? Let's bring back in our guests. Holland Reed, I want to go back and start with you, please, as someone who's been following this case since its inception. Uh, you really have your finger on the pulse of what's being said in the public, all of the people supporting those beautiful young uh, people who were murdered in that house. Uh, do you think we're going to see something stunning here in support of Brian Koberger? I, I can't imagine um, how, with all of the evidence that is mounted up against him so far, it's just incredible that there supposedly is an alibi or anyone that can testify on his behalf. What I think you're going to see is the love letters that he's getting from these women or these people that are obsessed with him, excess, uh, the, the sensationalism that has been around this. I think... If that's a character witness, then we're in big trouble um, for, for the justice system. But I just can't see anyone being able to be uh, the alibi that he's going to need to get him off um, off of four murder charges. I think you're absolutely right, Holland. I mean, why haven't we heard about these people yet? If you've got a witness, bring them to court with you. You know, and let's go back to something else here. The car. Mike Alcazar, initially when we heard about this, his defense team was saying, oh, he's in the car driving around all night. And I was saying on this program. Program. The car is not an alibi. Uh, Detective, your thoughts? Yeah, I think they're grasping at straws. Um, definitely he's driving around in his vehicle. His phone was pinged at the location of the homicide several times, and then it goes dark at a certain time when the homicides were committed. Uh, it's not looking good for Cobra. I think it's a stall tactic by his defense team. 
Right, I'm with you, Mike. Uh, Melba Pearson, would you take us home, please? What do you think is going to happen with this uh, uh, production of evidence that needs to occur by April the 17th? I think that there may be a request for another delay or continuance on April 17th in the hopes of buying more time. But I agree with what the rest of the guests said. If there was an alibi witness, they probably would have come forward way in advance of this present time. So I think they're grasping at straws. I think the evidence is a bit overwhelming that he was in the area. So I don't think anyone is going to be coming forward. Great points. Melba Pearson, we'll look forward to seeing you in what's tipping the scales of justice. we got to say goodbye and a big thank you to Detective Mike Alcazar and entertainment commentator Holland Reed. Thank you both. Here's what we have coming up next for you here on Opening Statements. I was led to believe that this world was an evil place filled with cops who control, hospitals that injure, government agencies that brainwash, and children who need abused. Our experts are standing by to break down Ruby Frankie's own words as we're getting more insight into the horrific abuse that her children suffered. Plus, missing toddler Elijah Vu's mother back in court pleading not guilty to charges of child neglect. To my babies, my six little chicks, you're a part of me. I was the mama duck who was consistently running you to safety. I can see now over the past four years I was in a deep undercurrent that led us to danger. This morning, we're shining a spotlight on the child abuse case involving mom fluencer Ruby Frankie and the handwritten notes that she made about abusing her young children. In her own words, we're learning about her perspective and also in some newly released jail calls that were obtained between her and her husband. So first, let's talk about the journal entries. She wrote it all down and now her words are coming back to haunt her as the Washington County Attorney's Office just released these journal entries. And one, Frankie writes, quote, big day for evil. E, that's her young daughter, E, E manipulates me. She won't scream when Jody's around, but with me, she wails. All night, E screamed, cried, and would hit her head on the floor. And another, R, that's the son who escaped and went to the neighbor's house. R looked like he wants to beat me up this morning, and then he was intrigued and interested. And then two hours later, he drinks water from the house, steals water. Steals water, right, because she's depriving them of the basic necessity of water and the other basic necessity of food. These allegations are stomach turning. I have two great guests on the show to talk about Ruby Frankie and these horrific instances that her children had to endure. Psychotherapist, author, and the host of the podcast Talking Live, Dr. Robbie Ludwig is with us. And forensic death investigator, professor, and the host of the Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan is with us as well. Good morning to you both. Dr. Robbie, I'd like to begin with you, please. Just looking at the two journal entries we just read, what do you glean from what Ruby Frankie is writing here? Well, I think Ruby really had a profound distortion. And I'd be really curious to know about her own history. I don't know if she was part of a religious cult or whether she has some kind of religious delusional system going on. But this woman really believed that her kids were evil and that what she was doing made sense to her. She described herself as a good girl, somebody who follows the word and did not see there's a complete disconnect between her actions and the, the horror she inflicted on her children and herself. There's just a disconnect. So I don't know if she was brainwashed by a cult or really sees herself as this religious martyr in many ways. Right. Dr. Robbie, I love so many things you said there, the brainwashing. I mean, when we see her sitting there in that police interrogation room, she looks 
kind of like she's been brainwashed. She sits there and she stares. It's a very different affect than what we see when she's on her YouTube channel and, and loving life and uh, talking all about her family. And, and you talked about how she calls herself a good girl. We've got that clip where this is from the jail. She's talking with her husband. Let's listen to it together now. Satan has taken everything away from me that I love. And I'm a good woman. I don't do naughty things. I don't do naughty things. I'm a really good girl. Oh my, is that the biggest lie that was ever told? Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, talk to me here, please. What do you think when you hear statements like that from Ruby Frankie? Well, I'll tell you one thing in response to the comment that was made just a moment ago about how she looked. She looks like she has full on uh, nutrition. She looks hydrated. Uh, and I, I see her as an individual that uh, cares not one whit about these children that are in her care. I think that that's one of the most important things here. Uh, thinking about the way the court has come down upon her, I, I don't know if, if people fully grasp these children that are in these developmental stages right now, what kind of price they're gonna have to pay physically. And I don't wanna get into to Dr. Robbie's area relative to the mental trauma, but just physical trauma as it, as it applies to their growth and development that this will resonate with them physically for years and years to come. Uh, and they've been compromised greatly. And I, I, I can't make heads or tails of it. I got to tell you, Julie, I, I know you probably don't want me to go there. But after having covered the Daybell case for so long, uh, low these many years, this just it, it, it smacks of that this justification for inflicting this kind of harm on people. Yes, no, I'm glad you went there, Professor Joe. You know, and when I think about what you do, you're a death investigator, and I've said this from the outset, and we've heard prosecutors say it recently, that 2020 documentary is excellent that ABC did, and, and they say that these children were on their way to the path of death. If they had continued on that path, curious, Professor Joe, is that what you see as well? Yeah, and, and it's quite striking, particularly I've seen cases of starvation, mal, malnourishment, that sort of thing. And many times this has to do with people that are held captive in homes, much like this. And the justification will vary from uh, person to person. Uh, but here's, here's kind of the baseline here. You think about this. I, I don't know if people understand the pain that's involved with starvation, but your body literally begins to consume itself if you don't have the appropriate nutrients that are coming on. So any kind of, of fat stores that you might have, you're gonna run through those pretty quickly. And the one comment to me, and she's really teetering on the edge here of, of toying with death. Uh, you think about that comment about water. Uh, deprivation of water is one of the most critical things that can happen. It, it's not just a matter of someone being dehydrated. It's a matter of the metabolic process that we go through day after day after day at a cellular level, and that all begins to collapse. And once that collapses, that's a train that you can't put the brakes on very easily. Mm -hmm. Right, Professor Joe. You know, she would watch the children. She and Jody watch it as they would brush their teeth to make sure they weren't ingesting any more water than was necessary to just brush their teeth. It, it is sickening. Uh, and on that point, Dr. Robbie, I want to go back to you, please, talking about what this has done to these children mentally. I have a couple more journal entries I'd like to show you now, please. Uh, this is where Ruby Frankie is saying, I cut off more of E's head, uh, her daughter. Uh, we doused her with water in the dog wash. He said she wanted to run away. Jody told E she has no idea what is waiting for her. When that little girl was found in that closet, police initially thought she was a boy because her head was shaved. She had kind of like a buzz cut, they described it. Uh, and then, uh, Ruby Frankie writes, these selfish, selfish children who desire only to take, like, and attack have zero understanding of God's love for them. Uh, Dr. Robbie, what has she done to her children mentally? Oh, these poor children, this will be a lifetime of, of treatment and horror and hopefully they get the right intervention. But basically they were raised by the devil mother. 
right? A mother who got her maternal instructions from, in her mind, the devil. And, you know, I can't even imagine. These children are supposed to be able to trust their mother. And instead, they had a mother who was basically killing them. And so they are going to have to, first of all, get physically healthy and begin to talk about living this nightmare. I only hope that they can find a, a loving home and that the treatments that we have now will get more sophisticated so that they can come out the other side having the opportunity to live a life that is sane and gain some normalcy. Right, Dr. Robbie. Dr. Robbie, on that point, are you confident that if these children are provided with the proper counseling and mental health services, can they grow up to live happy, healthy lives? You know, there's always hope. I think if they get the right love and if they're able and given permission to work through everything that they've experienced, this will always be a part of the fabric of their psyche, but there's always a possibility to use their experience to live a healthier, happier, more sane life. That's, it will require a lot of prayers and, and good interventions, but I'm a firm believer in the psyche being able to, to heal itself with the right interventions. Oh, Dr. Robbie, that's really encouraging. I know people around the world are wanting that for these children, for them to heal and be safe and be loved for the rest of their lives. We've got to leave it there for now, but great discussion with you both. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, Professor Joseph Scott Morgan, thank you both kindly for your expertise today. When we come back, here's what's coming up on Open opening statements. I want my grandson to be home with my family. So I want everybody to continue. Don't stop. Just searching for my baby Elijah. It's Elijah Vu's grandmother crying out for help. This little guy has become Wisconsin's toddler and he's still missing this morning. We'll talk about his mother next. Join Court TV's Vinny Politan. In every story, in every trial, every case, there's at least two sides to it. To dive into the latest. Oh my God. And breaking true crime stories. This was a very targeted, very personal attack. Inside. My whole life depends on it. And outside of the courtroom. She's a psychopath. Now, let's look at the other side of all of that. Vinny Politan investigates. Saturday morning, 10, 9 central. Only on Court TV. Now for what's tipping the scales of justice as the desperate search continues this morning for Wisconsin's toddler, three-year-old Elijah Vu. His mother, in the meantime, is pleading not guilty to charges of child neglect. Katrina Bauer appeared in court Friday, the hearing lasting all of two minutes. She's charged with child negligence involving another child. She's charged with obstruction and child neglect. Now, the other child is reportedly her six-year-old daughter. Police say Bauer left the little girl alone in a car for an hour in the freezing cold weather. Now, Katrina Bauer's boyfriend, Jesse Vang, was the last person to see Elijah. Elijah was staying at his apartment so that he could discipline the three-year-old. He's charged with felony child neglect. This is video from his most recent court appearance. Neither Bauer nor Vang are charged in connection with Elijah's disappearance, though. So let's be clear. They're both locked up, but no charges pertaining to Elijah just yet. That little sweetheart's missing for over a month now, and searchers are continuing their efforts to try to locate him. I have a great guest on the show to talk about this case. She's the director of prosecution projects at Florida International University. She's also a former homicide prosecutor. Attorney Melba Pearson is with us. Melba, knowing what you know about abusive parents, do you expect the mom and the boyfriend to start talking to police about what they know? 
I think that they will at some point. Um, right now, it's still early days. I think they're waiting to see what additional evidence might be found. Certainly, if the baby, the beautiful baby boy's body is found, then that changes the scope of things dramatically, and then it becomes a race to the courthouse steps. So at that point, if you know, once the body is found, Lord willing, then the two defendants will be battling it out between each other to see who can get the better deal and who can, you know, blame the other person. I'm sure a situation would arise where they both would be blaming the other one saying, hey, it wasn't me. You know, I wasn't the one that struck the death blow or I wasn't the one to, you know, leave, leave the child out in the cold or whatever the case may be. It was the other person. So I can kind of see that finger pointing uh, start to emerge as more evidence comes forth. Sure. Melba, being such a tremendous victim's advocate as you are, when you think about this little boy being sent to Vang's apartment to discipline him and the child was made to stand up for hours at a time, um, just all sorts of terrible things. Uh, to discipline him. He's three. They, they were disciplining him for soiling his diaper. He's three. He needs potty trained. I, I mean, tell me your thoughts on, on the egregiousness of, of that behavior. <laughs> I wish I could say I've never seen something like that before, but unfortunately I have. Um, there's no school for parenting, right? There's no license to be a parent. So people just do the best that they can with what they have. And unfortunately, if you were raised in a very violent environment or raised in an environment with black, there's a possibility that you would take that into your parenting style. So there's that aspect. If there's drug use involved, you know, I don't know if that's the situation here, but if there's you know, chronic drug use involved, that very quickly leads to child neglect because the focus is the addiction, not the child. Um, you know, the, the reality is what they did is absolutely disgusting. A three-year-old does not need to be disciplined in that manner. I understand if you send your teen son, let's say, to, leave, to live with someone else because of the fact that they may have been a little out of control. That's a different story, but not a three-year-old. And also, I want to note that back in 2015, you know, the defendant alleged that uh, you know, her boyfriend basically sexually assaulted her. So I'm a little confused at how we got from 2015, where she was filing charges and then dropped it against her co-defendant, to now 2023 or whatever the case may be, where she's leaving her child with him. So there's uh, there's some kind of strange toxic connection between the two of them, where she went went from alleging he was sex trafficking her and, and assaulting her to okay, he's appropriate to leave my child with. I have a lot of questions as to how that transpired over the course of the last almost decade. Yes, yes, Mel, but makes you wonder, is this mother really a victim of abuse too? Like you, you said exactly what I was thinking, toxicity. When you said, there, is there a toxic connection? You know, or was it a lie? Was it a fabrication from the outset? I, I just think we can't trust these two at all, can we? Sadly, at this juncture, they have not proven themselves to be trustworthy, right? And of course, to be clear, you're innocent until proven guilty. They don't need to prove anything. But looking at their prior actions and the prior patterns that we're seeing here, I, I, I don't see them as being trustworthy, unfortunately. No, not at all. Uh, Melba, great getting your insight on this case. Thank you for your time and expertise this morning. My friends, that is all for this episode of Opening Statements. You can watch it or share it if you want. Go to CourtTV.com to do it. Just click on the Shows tab. Up next, Court TV Live begins. I'm coming along with you as we go to Michigan for more of this latest trial, the Fugitive Wife Murder Trial. Be right back.